This is the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, friends in IoT. Welcome to Let's Connect, the newest podcast in the IoT for All Media Network. I am Ken Briota, Editorial Director for IoT for All, and your host. If you enjoy this episode, please remember to like, subscribe, rate, review, and comment on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And to keep up with all the IoT insights you need, visit iotforall.com. Before we get into our episode, the IoT market will surpass $1 trillion in the next few years. Is your business ready to capitalize on this new and growing trend? Use Leverage's powerful IoT solutions development platform to efficiently create turnkey IoT products that you can white label and resell under your own brand. Help your customers increase operational efficiency, improve customer experience, or even unlock new revenue streams with IoT. To learn more, go to iotchangeseverything.com. That's iotchangeseverything.com. Now, let's connect. My guest today is Miko Niemi, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Silicon Labs, and we're going to talk about all sorts of fun stuff within the industrial IoT and perhaps beyond. Miko, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, the pleasure is entirely mine. Thank you for joining me. Uh, in case folks aren't familiar with you, Miko, or with Silicon Labs, uh, can you give us a little bit of your background and sort of where y'all fit into IoT? Sure. So uh, let's start with uh, Silicon Labs uh, briefly. So we provide uh, Silicon products uh, for the smarter, more connected world, really uh, focusing on low energy consumption, simplicity, connectivity. So uh, we provide products for Bluetooth, Bluetooth Mesh, ZigBee, Z-Wave, Wizen, Wi-Fi. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And then we also have MCUs, wireless modules, and, and so forth uh, for the IoT uh, product lines. Myself, uh, I've, I've been kind of like... Uh, uh, switching industries for a couple times th throughout my career. So I started uh, my career really at uh, Polar Electro, which was uh, or which is a, the, the pioneer for uh, fitness trackers. So they invented uh, wireless heart rate monitors back in the 70s, and uh, uh, they've been kind of like the market uh, leader or, or the one of the top companies ever since. And from there, I went to a company called Landis & Gear, which for, for many doesn't sound like uh, too much, but it's actually the world leader in smart meters in the electricity space. So especially in the US, if you go to your backyard or wherever your electricity meter is, you might find their meter actually there. And, uh, and there I witnessed kind of like a single industry, the utility industry to shift from, let's say from the manual uh, reading collections to a fully automated IoT network solutions with uh with integrated solutions so that's that's sort of like uh was a a really good uh i would say platform to grow and uh, and understand how the iot in the industrial space works what are some of the requirements and uh, about a year and a half ago i joined silicon labs leading uh, industrial iot segment uh, at silicon labs and really uh i'm seeing the transformation now in in other areas of the industrial space uh Industry 4.0, obviously driving some of the, the landscape and, and everything. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to work for Silicon Labs and uh, seeing a great, great growth uh, in this space as well. So I know I promised that I would try to keep us on task, but first a digression. Uh, if you were working on some cool heart rate monitor stuff in the 70s, and were you in uh, Northern Europe at the time? And more to the point, how involved were you with the miracle on ice in 1980? Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have to, I'm I have to help us beat the Russians. That's all I want to know. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's all good. So I am from Finland, so I'm, uh, I'm from the country right next to the Russians. But uh, and I have to say that, you know, back in the 70s, uh, I was uh, I was still a small baby, so I was not inventing heart rate monitors back then, but the, the company <laughs> was. So, but uh, to to be fairly honest with you, I think that the team that back then has done pretty uh, groundbreaking uh, innovation by uh, figuring out how you can transfer the heart rate from those belts to a wrist unit, and and then uh, they even had these uh, 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 reading devices where you place basically the the wrist unit, and then it was like a serial connection. I saw just saw pictures of it and some very old uh, versions of the of the devices. It was pretty cool to see like how things have evolved from there to the modern watches where you have Wi-Fi and sometimes even say a little connectivity. So uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. That is, that's really, really cool. Um, but to the point, and uh, 
I want to start really, really high level before we dig into some of the the technologies that we're going to talk about. Um, I have been sort of bandying about the idea of a new term for IoT and more specifically, I think, industrial IoT, where a lot of people have been talking about digital transformation lately. And I think that there's an argument to be made that digital transformation that there is a digital transformation revolution coming that is going to include iot technology and industrial iot implementations but will also include lots of other uh technological innovations also that involve being interconnected that it will involve ai and, and machine learning things that will involve uh connectivity and and sometimes probably 5g and other times you know nbiot or or uh all Zig, zigbee z-wave all of the various things where appropriate lots and lots of lower wind probably but i i sort of think that that we're on the maybe not near the cusp but, but we're approaching needing a more umbrella term to talk about this sort of ecosphere and and i want to get your opinion uh feel free to tell me i'm wrong uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about the idea that we're currently working in IoT, industrial IoT, industry 4.0. But I think that we're actually a subset of this larger digital transformation revolution that is uh, really becoming transformative of everything that everybody's working on. So I'm curious about your opinions on on all of that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wide topic. So uh, thanks for bringing it up, Ken. So... I, I see that I, I kind of like share your vision of, of the bigger digital transformation. The whole, I think the digital is the key word uh, in, in all that we do. IoT, uh, the connectivity is just uh, uh, an enabler of, of many of those things, but it all, all boils down to the transforming many of the business processes that are underlining the, uh, the transformation. So supply chain is a great example, like how that is changing from uh, just transporting stuff from one place to another, and then the other one, uh, you know, opens up the doors of the truck and, and sees like, oh, what's inside? And uh, something, some things get lost or or, or whatnot, and uh, and all that. And at the same time, you know, reading how how the manufacturers how they want to approach kind of like the batch of one, like you order a device or or, or a product which is not even yet produced. And it gets mass customized for your needs, and and you can uh, basically produce just a a single product from the production line instead of pushing through like millions of the same product out. So, I think there is like all kinds of unique things that are going on, and how the how these um, manufacturers of these different types of uh, products have have to change or are changing their uh, their uh, processes and 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 businesses to be more let's say customer oriented and uh, and and uh, more more friendly in that way so i think that's that's an interesting time what we're seeing right now and uh, to some extent maybe the the whole pandemic has actually accelerated that development because of uh, needs for uh, remote monitoring and those kind of things that may have been neglected in the past because why why should we do it we have the people on the shop floor but uh, nowadays may not be the case so uh it's it's uh, it's all great it's it's really exciting times in the industrial I space right. i think you're right and that uh and i couldn't agree more about the the last you know uh, 10 months or a year really forcing that acceleration although i'm not entirely sure that that isn't my sort of innate optimism looking for a silver lining to the cloud of 2020 but um we'll see i think and i think uh that you'll turn out to be right that that this uh, whole experience sort of forced everyone to closer to innovation. Um, but let's move into some of the specifics that uh, that we wanted to touch on. And I want to start with asset monitoring. That is a, talk about a broad topic. There's just a million different, uh, well, assets to <laughs> to pay attention to. And and if you want to get granular, I mean, you can, you can say that that goes straight down to software code and like network monitoring that's all data is asset i think so i think there's an argument to be made that this is goes beyond the physical and into the digital like everything else does uh so uh let's narrow our focus a little bit what do you mean when you say asset monitoring what is sort of the the crux of that for you 
Yeah, so I, I would maybe narrow it down uh, to to few uh, few uh, you know topics. Uh, one one really interesting thing is like uh, in the logistics space. Like if you think that the uh, United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, they've estimated that thirty percent of the food is going to waste in the supply chain. It's a huge I've amount of food. Than that, yeah, yeah, that's 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 horrible that that happens because you know there are people uh, suffering from hunger and everything in the world. So. So uh, that kind of like the whole connected logistics, I think it's a it's a really excellent application for for asset monitoring. You're looking at the uh, 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 the refrigerated uh, containers and and trucks and everything, making sure that once once you are moving the the, the goods from one place to another, they stay in the right condition. Uh, also in the logistics space, detecting you know if someone tries to tamper with uh, with the containers and stuff, having sensors there. And and it's it's going to be an interplay between different technologies. So uh, if you think that you would have like a container full of uh, cellular uh, uh, connected sensors, how do you get the signal out from a container? It's like a Faraday cage. So you're likely more having like a local local network using some of the technologies like uh, Bluetooth low energy or Bluetooth mesh or things like that. And then you have the the backhaul technologies like NVIOT that you mentioned. That will take the data back to the to the central office, or some of our customers are even working kind of like the local network within the truck itself. So you will have like Wi-Fi connectivity between the cargo space and the the cockpit of the of the truck, where you can see that hey, uh, the temperatures are rising. So is there something going on? So maybe sometimes the driver can actually find a place to uh, to fix the issue while he's driving it. Instead of like blindly driving the truck all the way to the destination to find out that oh I was driving like uh, rotten carrots now so uh, it was it's 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 that's that whole logistics space is super interesting and I think Silicon Labs has really good uh, product line to to provide solution in that space. Well, I think I think you're right. I think that it is uh, not just interesting but but critical. Um, I'd like to think that the driver would pull over before he tried to fix the issue, but. Um, the uh nope that's exactly the response my joke deserved that's fine um the uh uh the really sort of salient point i think is one that we've realized recently the refrigeration point that you mentioned the the cold supply chain is in desperate need of this uh kind of asset tracking and monitoring and i think that they are starting to realize that now, not just because there's a, a COVID-19 vaccine that requires extreme refrigeration uh, for storage and transport, but uh, that has very narrow tolerances, but also because um, so much more stress has been put on the supply chain over the last nine or 10 months. I think that the the monitoring and the paying attention of the state of those packages in transit is not just critical to the survival of the the asset and the package, but also to customer service, to uh, satisfaction and and uh, business growth, to all aspects of the logistics uh, line and and company. Yep, absolutely. I think you're you're hitting the nail on on the head with that comment, uh, Ken. So I, I do agree that the uh, cold chain is is an area where you can gain a, a good payback for your investments. And, and in fact, in, in, in the food side of the cold chain monitoring, there are uh, increasing regulations. Uh, so uh, there was a few years ago, uh, this US regulation came into place, the food and food safety, uh, something like that. Uh, uh, food safety act was coming and And the same kind of like goes for the European Union region as well. And it's likely then expanding to, to some other regions as well. So that's partly driving that one as well. Uh, one technical aspect to that conversation is then, uh, is, is then, okay, so now we have all the data, how do we secure that? So cybersecurity becomes like a huge, uh, huge thing. And, and a very important thing is to just to uh, make sure that though uh, the integrity of the reads can be, can be uh, kept. Because imagine that someone tampers the, the readings they can fool the system. So you want to make sure that uh, 
the products that you deploy are are highly secure and 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 can face the uh, the challenges coming from from the attacks. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, and and that uh, actually transitions us beautifully into the next topic we want to talk about, which is sort of the uh, the ultimate expression of execution on data, which is predictive uh, analytics and uh, predictive maintenance and and monitoring. Uh, it, within not just within the industrial space, but but sort of everywhere, where you take your sensor data, your data collect, your historical record, and uh, sort of train and and run an algorithm to predict when there will be faults and avoid downtime. Predict when there will be a, a need for you know, repair or even just regular replacement of you know, batteries or whatever. Um, so this is a concept that I think people are becoming very familiar with, but the actual use cases and, and execution is still seems very rare. I don't, I can't off the top of my head think of a, a truly predictive maintenance system that I know of offhand. Now that doesn't mean one doesn't exist. It just means I don't know about it, but um, to, to, one that isn't just programmed with a schedule of, you know, they talk to the expert guy who works on the line and he says, yeah, we do this every three weeks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I want actual predictive machine intelligence to say it's actually uh, you, you need to do this uh, two weeks and three days from now, even though you did three weeks last time. <laughs> yeah. So um, that, that's, that's an excellent uh uh, segue to another uh, excellent topic of uh, industrial IoT, the predictive maintenance. And uh, just for the listeners, uh, you're basically trying to uh, avoid unplanned outages because uh, that, that's usually the most costly uh, thing uh, is the unplanned outage of any kind of industrial process. Sure. And, uh, and and why it is so costly is because it happens, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, and, uh, and and then then you have to rush. Like, uh, did you have the spare parts in stock? Did you have the people that can do the repairs in uh, uh, in place and all those kind of things? And things start to get crazy. So, but with predictive maintenance, you're trying to uh, predict that hey, this thing is going to fail in the next uh, three months or so. So, uh, hey, I can place the order for the for the new bearing. I can go ahead and schedule the maintenance guy. I can get everything this lined up before the whole thing breaks down. Plus, I can plan it ahead of time. So when I have to maybe bring the whole process down for the maintenance, I can plan to do something else as well and and, and get kind of like the, the biggest bang for the buck when you actually have to shut down the processes. So that's what you try to do. And, and growingly, uh, people have tried to solve this problem by, hey, I'll put these uh, vibration sensors into my motors and pumps and everything, and I'll send all the data back to the cloud. So... Interestingly, uh, it's it's a great great idea because the cloud has the, uh, basically unlimited uh, processing power and, and storage for the data. Right. So and and you can train as sophisticated uh, AI machine learning models and everything. So now, if you think that okay, that's only one application trying to uh, compete of the airspace, if you will, and there are other radio devices working at the same frequency band, sending stuff that someone else wants for their processes. So now you have this uh, aerospace competition, and uh, and and so, uh, we've heard from some of our uh, customers that they start to see that there could be some congestion at the network level because you have so many sensors trying to send the raw data back to the cloud. Well, in predictive maintenance cases, uh, I would say ninety nine percent of the data is pretty much redundant. It's basically telling the 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 cloud algorithm that everything is just fine. So uh, you're basically uh, overusing the network for just passing the raw data, which leads to uh, the, the growth of the embedded AI machine learning. So you actually train the model and you bring it all the way to the end sensor node. And, and, and then you train the end sensor node uh, with, uh, with the machine learning algorithm and the local conditions. And now it can actually start uh, Looking at the data that is is being measured from the vibration or something else, and uh, and and predicting from there that hey, this actually provides the signature that is an anomaly. I need to alarm, but for the most part, it doesn't change uh, or send anything out. And what we've seen, uh, and then some of the other folks in the industry have seen and witnessed is 
this can actually save your battery life. So it's pretty unintuitive that, hey, I'm doing more calculations at the edge. But if you think that uh, the other alternative is, OK, I turn my radio on, and the radio is typically the most power consuming part of the whole sensor. Sure. So, so you're basically reducing the data transmission, which gives you some, uh, let's say, capacity to run the algorithm at the edge and only send the anomalies out. So really, that that is an area that I think will grow dramatically in the next uh, couple of years when people start to understand that, hey, I can run a TensorFlow model uh, in in uh, in our 32-bit uh, MCUs. You don't need like a a, a GPU uh, processor to do that. You can do it with these low-power MCUs that are yeah. used in these sensors. So I think that's that's really interesting uh, area of uh, of development that we're seeing, and I'm, I'm believing it uh, uh, quite big time that it it will pick up uh, speed in, in the next few years. I think the the low power consumption part of the equation is really sort of the the silver bullet of of the edge uh, being effective. I, I think that we need this sort of almost nano cloud of edge devices and sensors and whatnot that are doing processing and not requiring frequent maintenance themselves because now you've created a whole nother layer of need for maintenance so let's make sure that those guys are pretty much self-sufficient um the the other aspect since since you brought up the edge and and the important of this importance of this sort of predictive processing happening there the other piece of that equation that uh i'm i'm always fascinated by it and really excited by is the the digital twin and how you can do modeling and experimentation and and sort of learning outside the system based on those same historical models in the cloud using all that processing power and then just send your your outcomes back down to the edge to change behavior and and alter the the actual working algorithm that seems like just such a uh milestone in functionality and uh i i don't know how much uh uh, you've worked with uh, with Digital Twin at Silicon Labs or, or elsewhere, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, I think uh, the Digital Win Twin uh, is is also a very interesting development, and I think it it basically falls uh, under the umbrella that we discussed early on, what, which was the digitalization of the whole of of the whole industry, and uh, and basically that is uh, showing you details of the device. Uh, as it you know is is aging and you can you can like you said change the settings and all that, I think that that provides uh, such a interesting uh, amounts of data to the engineers who are working with those processes and everything that it 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 will likely be growing uh, dramatically in in the future, and and what you need for that one is of course uh, uh, sensors and data because uh, just providing. Uh, runtime data and all those kind of things is just not enough for uh, creating like the full picture. So you're likely uh, you're likely uh, going to be integrating some of these use cases together, like digital twin, predictive maintenance. So uh, and and all those kind of things are likely somehow summing up to a, a bigger picture of the whole industrial processes and systems. Sure, and uh, I think that the the larger and more interconnected your digital twin gets, the more like the entire IoT system it looks, the more you can learn from it. And the more you can find those sort of unintended consequences that can be either ways to avert disaster, like downtime and, and other problems, or product loss or anything else, or ways to discover new unexpected profit centers or opportunities or uh, uh, efficiencies. I think that, that 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 kind of intelligence can go uh, to the advantage of the company looking for it in a lot of ways. And uh, uh, there's not a lot of case against it, except for scale and like ability to to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. And I think the I think the new business models, all kinds of as a service type of business models, are are definitely going to need need the data. And uh, and and like I think it was uh, was it Rolls Royce or whoever uh, invented kind of like the airplane motor uh, uptime kind of like mm -hmm. they were selling just the the uptime hours uh, for the airlines. You didn't pay anything for the motor, so or the engine. So I think the same 
to some extent can happen in the industrial space that you're you're buying like a production line as a service and then uh uh, you're just paying like a monthly fee for it, but it's 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 long ways ahead. But I think something like that could happen uh, eventually yeah. in the in the future. I, I you know uh, I think that was GE actually, uh, but they may make the engines that Rolls Royce sells. I'm not sure, but I, I'm pretty sure GE was doing that uptime sales uh, also. And uh, uh, my only concern with that is sort of the subscription fatigue problem that. Uh, we haven't really hit yet, but everybody's starting to talk about uh, when I start talking about the as a service model is is folks are worried about, uh, you know, somebody in the, some CFO somewhere going, what do you mean we're paying 35 different monthly fees for all this and we don't own anything? <laughs> and so uh, I'm not I'm not I don't have a solution for that problem, but I do see it coming. And uh, I'm I'm thinking that the answer to that is going to be what IoT already does and is good at, which is the sort of partnership economy and and bundling a solution into one profit share solution model on the on the business development side. I think that that's a strategy to address the uh, the subscription fatigue problem before we reach it. Yeah, and and I think uh, as long as you can really solve a problem for your customer, uh, then the subscription fee is likely more more successful model for you. Like uh, in my past with my previous employer, Landis and Gear, we had uh, what we called the managed services customers. And, and basically the customer was just buying the, the, the meter reads. So the product that was sold to them was the meter reading file. And, and we had people who were taking care of the smart metering networks and, and everything along those lines. So that was really interesting, interesting way to do it because if, if the customer, which in this case was a utility didn't do it, then uh, they would have had to hire people who knows uh, IT, who knows how to run those systems and everything. So now right. you're actually solving a new problem for them uh, that the digitalization is is bringing. So as long as you you keep that in mind, I think you you have a chance to be successful. But if you try to nickel and dime more money out of your existing customer base just by uh, turning something into a, a subscription based, you might not be successful at the end. <laughs> uh, that was very politically uh, said. Well done. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we're getting near the end of our time, uh, Miko, and uh, I know we haven't even hardly scratched the the surface of this topic. So uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll have to have you back on uh, at some point later in the year, and, and we'll talk about how things are going. But for now, I, I want to give you sort of the uh, the the last word, uh, and and if there's something sort of that you really want to make sure the listeners go home with. Uh, this is your opportunity to, to leave it with them. Sure. So I, I think uh, I would highly encourage you know the listeners to 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 visit our uh, website scilabs.com and and start looking at kind of like we have we are going to be having a lot of good. Uh, there's already good content out there uh, on our website, but we will be definitely having more more interesting stuff coming up this year. It's it's going to be a big year for us. And, uh, and 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 all that. So I, I really do think that the industrial IoT is now picking up the, the pace and, and it's going to outpace to some extent, I think the smart home space because there's just so many many opportunities to, to develop this. And uh, in addition to the asset monitoring, there is the human machine interfaces that we didn't have time to discuss, but it's also something that is doing a transformation. And, and we held a webinar uh, last year on, on that one as well. So. I really, uh, uh, I'm excited about this opportunity, Ken, to speak with you. I'm happy to come back and uh, uh, talk about some other topics uh, later in the year. That would be awesome. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyone who kind of like wants to uh, know, personally connect with me, you know, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and send me a connect request so I can definitely uh, uh, continue the conversation with you guys uh, uh, privately there. So. Yeah, and uh, uh, we'll put those links into the, the show notes for you folks out there listening. Um, and uh, yeah, I definitely want to talk to you again about the human machine interface stuff because I personally welcome our cyborg overlords, and I think uh, I think everyone else does too. <laughs> so, uh, Miko Niemi, senior product manager for Silicon Labs, thank you so much for being my guest. It's been really a pleasure to have you, and and thanks for talking talking with me today. Thanks very much, Ken.
Thanks again to all of you listening out there. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion, and if you have, please make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our episodes. We post every week, and I hope you'll leave us a rating, review, and comment on your favorite podcasting platform. If you'd like to suggest a guest, please click on the link in the description. And we also have a great sister podcast on our network called the IOP for All Podcast, so make sure you check that out. Hey, Ken, let me jump in real quick and introduce your audience to another awesome show on the IOT for All Media Network, the show that started it all, the IOT for All Podcast where I bring on experts from around the world to showcase successful digital transformation across industries. We talk about use cases and IoT solutions available in the market and provide an opportunity for those companies to share advice to help the world better understand and adopt IoT. So if you're out there listening and haven't checked it out, be sure to go check out the IoT for All podcast available everywhere. Thank you, Ryan. Now get back to your show. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Let's Connect. I've been Ken Briota, Editorial Director of IoT for All, and your host. Our music is Sneaking on September by Otis McDonald. And this has been a production of the IoT for All Media Network. Take care of yourself. You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network.